This review has been a long time coming. For the Sony Alpha 1, Canon R5C, Canon R5, and also the A7 IV, which is that camera right there, uh, that we're going to put against each other in the context of real estate photography. We also have the Sony A7S III up there, which we might talk about uh, from time to time as well. So this is going to be a long video. Uh, it's going to be a long video because I have been using all of these cameras side-by-side side out shooting jobs for the past month or two. There's a lot to cover. There are some big differences. Uh, there are some similarities, but most of them are differences. So it is going to be a long overview of this. And then if there's interest, I can do another video kind of delving down into some of the things that I'm going to mention, however, just kind of fly over. So here we go. The first thing that really needs to be mentioned with this is that you have to understand the context in which I am presenting this. I am a full-time real estate photographer, and that is the perspective that I have. And so when I talk about features of these different cameras and these different systems, it's important to keep that in mind. And so features like, for instance, uh, maximum flash sync shutter speed, which the Alpha 1 does the best at 1 400th. That's going to be an important spec to me because I can use that to control window light while cranking ISO to get my flash to be a more powerful flash. However, if you were, let's say, a landscape photographer, that wouldn't matter one bit. But what might matter to you is that the system is more compact and lighter than one of these other ones. That doesn't matter to me because I have a van that everything goes in. I don't care how big or heavy it is. I just care that it's going to get the job done that I need it to get done. So uh, just keep that in mind um, as we're doing this. I'm talking about these cameras specifically in the context of real estate photography. So I have a bunch of notes um, that I have written down here, and uh, I'm just going to get into it. So the Sony, and you know what, let me take off the R5C here because we're just going to do the, the R5 and A1. So the first thing to keep in mind, okay, is that it is impossible to separate these two systems from their lenses when you're comparing them. Now, there is a way to compare just the bodies, and that is they both adapt Canon EF mount glass non-natively, but I wanted to kind of do this like somebody would be out there using it to shoot real estate. And so for the Sony bodies, that would most likely be the 16 to 35 G Master. And for the Canon bodies, it would be the 15 to 35 2.8 L series RF. And so th those are the lenses that, that I'm using on these respective bodies when I'm going out there and, uh, and working. Now, the difference in the lenses are somewhat significant. And after using the Canon system and the Sony system side by side for about a month, it really gave me a new appreciation for the older 16 to 35 G Master lens. Now, I will say that the 15 to 35 RF seems to be punchier, more contrasty, and perhaps a little bit sharper as well. But a big flaw with the 15 to 35, and this might be because it goes that one millimeter deeper, is the flaring. Um, so the flaring on the G Master is, it, it certainly will, you know, when you have a, a sun coming straight into the lens, but it's kind of a more washed out. So your whole image gets a little bit less contrasty and a little bit less saturated, which is something that's pretty easy to deal with in post. Whereas the 15 to 35 will do that too. It's, it's a little bit more immune to that type of a flare, but what it, what it will do is it has a very pronounced flare pattern. And not only that, but I, I found that it's more susceptible to dust on the actual front element of the lens. So when the sunlight hits that dust, it'll make a big orb, you know, in your picture. And the G Master doesn't really, 
isn't really seem doesn't seem to be affected by by the dust like that. So that that was an interesting thing, you know, something with the the coatings that Sony uses and the coatings that that Canon uses and the differences between them. Which one would I pick? Um, in a perfect world, I'd probably have the G Master uh, because you know, aside from those things that I said, when you are looking at just the performance of the two lenses at their widest end, and so fifteen millimeters here, sixteen millimeters there. The 16 millimeters in the Sony bodies, by way of both the Sony uh, software and the Adobe software with the profile corrections, is a little bit better corrected. When you have these ultra wide, and yeah, 15 and 16 millimeters, I, I do consider ultra wide perspectives, they have interesting distortion patterns. It's not always barrel distortion, but it's kind of a mustache. Uh, is distortion in, in lenses that are kind of like this, the ultra wide zooms. And the Sony just seems to be a little bit straighter. Um, you know, you, you can, I can go over this more uh, in the future if anybody's interested. So let's talk about the, um, the difference in the two bodies and the feel of them. Um, the, now what's funny about this is Canon has always been regarded as having a good feel in the hand. You know, I have a Canon camera and it, and it feels great and everything's laid out where I want it to be. Um, I actually prefer the feel of the Sony. And, and I, had to, I had to try to figure out why this is. And I think why it is, is this particular thing right here. You can see that the Sony is a little bit more indented on that, that choil right there. Whereas the Canon is not as aggressive on that particular groove. Now, something about that groove just gives your finger somewhere to go. And, and it feels really good in the hand because of that. So the Canon by comparison, like I said, that, that groove isn't as pronounced right there. And so it doesn't quite conform as well to your hand. And the grip is, is more angular right here, which I don't know, it, it just, I think some people will probably like the Canon better, but I personally like the Sony. I have pretty average hands. Um, I do run battery grips on both of these. I, I don't see <laughs> really how people work with these without a battery grip because I do have pretty average hands and it, you know, it's there, there's, there's nowhere for your pinky to go on these things without a, without a grip on it. So anyway, I digress. I like battery grips. That's one of the reasons is that, um, the other reason I like battery grips is because when I'm out shooting real estate, one of the things that I like to do is get detailed shots of faucets in homes because it's an easy shot to get. It pads the count of images that you're giving to the customer. And if I were to put this on a counter like this, okay, the height of that lens is going to be a better height than if I don't have a battery grip on it and I put it on the counter. You know, I mean, I could hand hold it, but then I got to crank my ISO and my share speed, you know, all that kind of stuff. And so it's another practical reason for battery grips is that. And the third practical reason for battery grips kind of goes along that is when I'm out shooting, especially exteriors, the way that I like to stabilize the camera is I will kind of turn to the side and use this shoulder as a point of contact and this this is how I, I will typically be holding the camera like this um this extra depth on the battery grip goes a long way to making that comfortable or else you know without one I'm, I'm doing that so those are the reasons i like battery grips along with the extra battery life here's a big one we're going to talk about the focusing systems between the the sony and, and the canon now it's important to realize that i am not I, I am brand agnostic when it comes to camera gear, okay? I, I like shooting on red cameras. I like shooting on black magic cameras, which is what I'm shooting on right now as my A cam, Sony, Canon. I don't care, okay? So I know this is one of those things that people get tribal over. Who has the better autofocus system? I don't care what name is stamped on the camera, but I will tell you right now, it is Sony. <laughs> it's, it's Sony with the Alpha One. It is an incredible it is so fast and so sticky when you're tracking things. Canon just doesn't have that. You know, they, they don't have it in this camera and they don't have it in the R5C. Maybe the R3 behaves a little bit differently, but I think the, uh, 
the DPAF Mark II or whatever they call their focusing system. I think that's the highest one they have that the R3 kind of shares too. It does different things like eyeball tracking and such. But, you know, the Sony is not as tailorable as the Canon. And this this is what, you know, this is one of the reasons I had to really work with these for a long time before I made this video because the Canon has a lot of different ways you can set it up. They have different cases, they call them, and so the, the tracking behavior will uh, react differently depending on one, two, three, or four, you know, which case you have set up. Um, it, it has... It just has more tailorability than the Sony does. The Sony's system is simpler than that, but it works better. I mean, I, I paint a target with the size of box that I define, and it sticks on that target like glue. Um, I can swap targets if I want, and I can adjust the sensitivity like I can the Canon, but, you know, you get into the Canon system, it's like, case? <laughs> You know, what, what does that even mean, you know? So it's it's taken me a while to figure out, you know, the case and, and the servo and the continuous AF and the, you know, keep hunting when the focus isn't found. You know, there's a lot of things on, on the Canon that you just have to familiarize yourself with if you're not used to using them like I wasn't. The Sony's just easier for anybody to pick up and start using well right away. And uh, beyond that, like I said, I just think it works better. You know, the AF system works better. Beyond AF, uh, I use manual focus probably 90% of the time, at least. And that's when I'm on a tripod, I'm doing flash ambient composites, I, I'm locked off. And so most of the time I'm using manual focus with that. This kind of spills a little bit over into using the apps to wirelessly tether, which we'll get into. But as far as using manual focus is concerned, the Canon does have an advantage in that they have a manual focus tool where you will define the focus point that you want it to focus on, even though it's manual. You will then turn the focus wheel and the arrows will come into line and it will turn into a green box when it's in focus. That's really handy. And um, the reason it's really handy is because the Canon app is... A little lacking <laughs> in a few ways uh, compared to the Sony app. So I do like the manual focus on the Canon a bit better than the Sony. Having said that, there is one thing I like about the manual focus on the Sony, and that's the scale is different. And so when you take a look at the, the numbers and the focusing scale on the Sony, I can go to three or four meters, and I will see on there that it is at three or four meters. Uh, and also you can do peaking and, and things like that. Whereas the Canon, I think it goes from it's a bigger jump. You know, it goes from like three to infinity or something. You know, so you don't really know exactly where it is unless you touch and then use that uh, focus tracking uh, tool to do it. And, and so that, that works. I like, I like the Canon implementation a little bit better of the manual focus system. But like I said, the caveat is the, uh, the app, and, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, white balance between the two cameras. This is something that I find the Sony is a little bit more consistent with, uh, but there are differences in just the way the camera is reading white balance. Now, I'm going to give this a caveat because I haven't dived way deeply into the Canon. I know with the Sony, you can do um, auto white balance with a priority of white, and so white things are going to remain white, and that's going to be different than whatever the other option is, you know balanced average or whatever it is. Um, I don't know if the Canon does that too, but I do see that during auto white balance, the Sony is consistently a couple hundred Kelvin cooler than the Canon is. And like I said, the, the word that I used was consistent. And what I mean by that is if I'm photographing a home and it's the front of the home, and let's say it's neutral, and so it's white or it's gray or, you know, taupe or something like that. When I photograph it dead on, and then I go to do like a 45 degree angle uh, of that same facing wall of the house, I am more likely to get two images where the white balance, which is going to be changing, but where it's reading it and balancing it out to be consistent on that wall than with the Canon. The Canon, I have a little bit more trouble in post where one of those will be a little bit warmer and greener, and the other will be cooler and magenta, or, you know, and, and it's just those, that variable seems to be better behaved on the Sony and, and how it reacts to it. 
the cards, the, you know, the media that they take, the buffers, the write speeds, and things like that. So I prefer the Sony implementation of this because the CF Express Type A cards, these little buggers that are super expensive, by the way. Uh, this is a 160 gig card and it's like 400 bucks or something like that. Might even be more than that. I forgot how much they are. They're expensive though, whatever they are. Um, I, I like it because for a few reasons. It's a little bit smaller than an SD card. The card slots that this camera has in it are able, both of the slots, it's a, a two slot camera, is able to accept either those CF Express A cards or SD cards. Now the CF Express A card are not as fast as the uh, CF Express type B cards that you will find in the Canon body, but the media in this body is asymmetric. And so it's only going to accept one CF Express type B card. And the other slot in there is going to be just a, a UHS-2 SD card, which means when I'm recording on the Sony, whether it be for stills or for video, the biggest frame rates and codecs and everything that I can do on the Sony, I can still redundantly record it to both cards, whereas you cannot do that with the Canon. You know, you, you can you can do record it to one card and then proxies on another one. You know, there, there are different ways you can set it up still, but I like the Sony implementation of that better because even though the Canon does do some uh, on its video side, the, the frame rates and, and the bit, especially the R5C there, you know, will certainly stress a CF Express type A card. These cards in practice are really fast. I mean, they, they really are. I, I don't think you're going to be using these things and say, oh man, this is so much slower than a B card. You know, on paper, maybe it is because of how many lanes they have or whatever, right in the information. But, um, you know, the, the whole body itself and the buffer and how it rests, that this is a really, really fast ecosystem here. So I like the Sony for that reason. I think the cards are fast enough, and I like that they're the same ones. I like that I can redundantly record to them, and that I don't have to have a lot of different kinds of cards and card readers and stuff all over the place. I think that's a better, more well-thought-out system. The other thing to mention about all of that, too, is buffers and buffer speeds. The A1 is, is really built for speed, okay? And in fairness, we're talking about a camera that's almost twice the price of the other one. You know, I mean, it is, it is an extraordinarily expensive camera. But if you've never seen this thing with 50 megapixel raw files, which are about 100 megs a piece, how fast that buffer in real time clears it, it is crazy uh, to see that. So, you know, the Sony is definitely, definitely the faster camera by a country mile than the Canon. That may or may not be worth anything to you, but it is, you know, it's true. Next thing I think uh, we're talking about is uh, flash sync speed. Well, let's get into that after exposure tools. And so, you know, so exposure tools on the Sony. Now I've been a Sony shooter for several years. I have uh, started with the a7 III, which I still have one. I've tried to sell it and that's a whole story that I'm gonna make a video about. Um, I had the A7R3, A7R4, A7 IV, A7 IV, A1. I, I'm very familiar with Sony bodies. And one of the things that the Sonys do very well that the Canons do not do is in stills modes, I can still use zebras. And that's huge. And it's funny because I was talking uh, with my buddy, uh, Carlos Quintero, uh, and he has a great YouTube channel. You should check it out. And... You know, when I first brought this up to him, he says, so you want video tools and, and stills modes? You know, and I said, no, it's, it's not a video tool. It's, it's an exposure tool, you, you know? So on the Canons, you have a histogram, which now you, you can also have as an RGB histogram so you can see which channel, you know, is, is close to clipping or whatever. But that's not as useful as being able to define lower limits with zebras and see, you know, especially when we're shooting things like real estate, which is very dynamic, we can have a very dark interior and then have nuclear light blowing in through the window. Um, it's nice to see what parts of your image are exposed at what values. And being able to set zebras in a couple different ways really goes a long way to that. 
I have no idea why Canon doesn't do this, by the way, um, because they have zebras in their cameras that they use for video. Why can't we use it for stills? I don't know, but it'd be handy. Uh, in the R5C, it's, I mean, it's got false color in the R5C. I'd love to use that for stills, uh, you know, but I don't know. They, they kind of define that as, as a video tool, whereas I just look at it as a useful exposure tool. Flash sync speed is one that the Sony A1 has a 1 400th of a second mechanical flash sync speed. And, and in the intro, I, I kind of talked about this a little bit. What that allows you to do is have a small-ish light. So for instance, I use the Godox 8200 Pro, I think it is now, but I have a few of them. It's a 200 watt second strobe, little one. You know, it's about twice the size of a speed light. And uh, it's great. Ever since I started using those lights that I don't, I have bigger lights. I just, I don't use them, uh, you know, because especially with a camera like this, what I can do, if I need that flash to be much more powerful, I can crank up the ISO to say 640, right? And so now my 200 watt second light is going to be, you know, a few stops more powerful than it was at one of the lower base ISOs. What's going to happen when you crank up your ISO to 640 is now your bright windows are going to be even more bright. We can, with this camera, go up to 1 400th of a second on our shutter speed to control that window light and then be able to balance your strobe and your window light. That is a big advantage the Sony A1 has over every camera on the planet except for some medium format ones that use leaf shutters in the lenses. Okay, but as far as the major manufacturers go, this is top of the pile. The R3 has a 1 250th. The, uh, the Nikon Z9 has a 1 200th, I think. It might be 250th, but it's all electronic shutter, and that's a different conversation for a different day. Um, but 1 400th, and, and that's, this is the only camera on the planet that does that. So how big of a deal is that? As I've been using the R5 lately, I can use the R5 very effectively, even though it only goes up to 1 250th. But it's something that if you're looking at these two cameras or these two systems for real estate photography, that's a big one. I mean, that is a, it is a really handy feature to have. And, you know, as I've been kind of working with these cameras and research, you know, and, and preparing to do this video, as I'm using this camera, I'm now paying more attention to how often do I do that? You know, how often do I go up to one? More often than you would think, <laughs> you know, so do you need it? No, this is a definitely a, still a workable camera, but uh, just today, actually, I, I shot earlier today a, uh, a, a dark interior home with a bright outside and, and I shot it on the R5 and I found myself thinking, you know, if I had that one four hundredth of a second, my light could get stronger and so it's, it's something that's useful. Let's talk about, where did I put the R5C? Let's talk about battery life. <laughs> that's where the R5C comes in, right? Um, we all know about the R5C battery thing. And there's a lot of noise that's made over the R5C battery thing online. Let me just assure you that it is 100% completely true. All of this, it is... It's crazy. It's laughable how bad the battery life is on the R5C. And what's funny about it is people will say, well, when you're flipped over to the stills operating system, you know, the fan isn't running and stuff. And so it's the same battery life as, as the R5 and the stills. No, the, the Canon has figured out some other way to make this drain about twice as fast as the regular R5, even in stills mode. I have no idea, <laughs> you know, and I went, you know, I've gone through both, you know, the menu systems, which are the same, you know, in the stills mode and this, I, I have, it just does. Next, let's talk about file sizes uh, between these cameras. Now, what's interesting is the Sony Alpha 1 has 50 megapixel RAWs. The Canon R5 has 45 megapixel RAWs. So you would imagine that the file sizes are going to be pretty comparable, but they aren't. Okay, the Sony files are about twice as heavy as the Canon files. These ones being about 100 megabytes a piece, these ones being about 45, 50 megabytes a piece. My experience in working with the files, it seems that the Sonys are also a little bit more malleable 
in post, but we're talking slightly. Um, you can recover a little bit more highlights with the Sony. You can push a little bit more shadows with the Sony. The minute differences that we're talking here, and, and, it's, and it's hard to even discern on a lot of images, in my mind, it's not worth twice the file size, especially considering that I outsource a lot of my composite editing these days. And so being able to send editors 100 images versus it would be the same as sending 200 images on that, it, it makes a difference. It makes a difference going there. It makes a difference coming back. makes a difference sending them to the client and how the client's going to work with them. They're just lighter file sizes on the Canon. And it, it's, I, get, I guess it's just because the, uh, the codec is, is more efficient. A little bit more information to play with on the Sony. I don't think for real estate photography that matters one bit. I'll take the Canon on. So let's talk a little bit more about that too uh, as it relates to ISO invariance and performance. A big deal was made on the R5C in video mode about how... Now it's dual gain. And so you've got a, I think it's eight, yeah, it's 800 base ISO and then 3200 is the, uh, the second native gain stage on it. But in stills mode, I mean, these cameras are all kind of dual gain sensors in stills mode and they have been for a long time. I don't know why that doesn't get more traction, you know, on YouTube, but it is. So the Sony is 100 and 640, I think, and the R5 is 100 and 400, I think. Um, and that's just the, the point where as it pertains to ISO invariance, and I'm not going to go into that if you don't know what it means, then look it up. Um, you know, basically with this camera, you are at some point, uh, at some point better going to the 640 than like say 400 because it's ISO invariant up to about 320 or so, right? So it, it's neither here nor there. Um, both cameras behave pretty similarly um, in that regard. I do find that when I am pushing shadows up. Um, I like the grain on the Canon better than the Sony. And that's the, the noise pattern that it makes is a little bit cleaner in that the Sony noise has color in it. So it's, it, it's got a lot of chroma noise and, you know, big color blotches and things like that. Whereas the Canon is very kind of monochromatic. And so it looks more kind of just like a grain than than the sony so you know i'm still playing with with this particular because it just depends on a lot of things um you know where your base exposure was what kind of light and color channels are hitting and all that and so it's it's hard to kind of call a winner or loser on that because they're about the same resolution and they both have a lot of dynamic range i prefer the canon look for that something else i prefer about the canon um is the colors and i know this is another one where people get tribal over um Colors are different in cameras, you know, and YouTube is, has no shortage of people who say, well, if you know how to color grade and if you shoot wrong, it still matters. You know, I mean, cameras still look different. And if cameras didn't look different, then you wouldn't have top professionals that are purposely choosing to shoot on red or to shoot on Fuji or to shoot on Hasselblad or, say, you know, because it matters. I mean, it does. You know, you, you can tweak colors and a good colors can get it kind of there, but there still is just a look that cameras have. That's one of the reasons I love shooting on the Red Komodo. I love the look of the Red Komodo straight out of camera. It just looks good, you know, and you can, you can get these other cameras fairly close to that. You can't get it all the way to that. So I like the Canon colors better than the Sony colors. That's all I'm going to say about that. Now we come to the moment that no one was waiting for, and we're going to talk about video. That's why the R5C is up here. Because we're talking about real estate hybrid cameras here. The R5C is clearly the best video camera on this table. And it's, you know, it's really not even close. It's, it's the best straight video camera, but... It is also the camera that I would not recommend to anyone shooting real estate professionally. Either the A1 or the R5, I would recommend over, or the A7 IV, I would recommend over the R5C. 
it's kind of a one-trick pony. So the R5C is the R5, but with 8K60. And everybody else say, but wait a second, you've got a whole cinema operating system, and you have all these exposure tools, and you have the, you know, shutter angles. It, 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 yes, it has all that. Um, but for what we're doing daily, for the filming of houses that are listed for sale, and the occasional agent intro that goes along with them, none of that really matters for that. 8K60 in RAW, that's cool. And that's where this would be fantastic, except even that is crippled a little bit. And by that I mean in 8K60, this camera loses the ability to, to be able to do object tracking with its focusing system. And that is the way that I personally like to work with interiors video. I love working with the A7S III because it's got a great, it's just like the A1, it's got a great focus tracking system and I can poke on something halfway through, still shoot with a big open iris and control that shallow depth of field very precisely as I plan my shot through to get a lot of light into the sensor. I cannot do that with the R5C in 8K60. R5, I can do it in 4K60. So, you know, it's just, it's not a practical camera. It, the battery life is horrendous, you know, and, and so the way that I have it set up is I actually have a V-mount that's on the bottom of the sled of my uh, DJI RS2 to be able to feed it power, and it works like that, you know, to give it AK-60, and um, AK-60 is cool, you know, you can descale noise, and just, I mean, I'm not saying it's bad here, but... Ultimately, as a tool for real estate, it is $1,000 more than the R5, and the R5 is better in almost every way than the R5C. Here's another thing the R5 is, is better at than the R5C. With the R5, you can use that Canon Connect app to monitor not only in photo but in video also with the R5C you cannot do that. So when you flip over to the cinema operating system it, you lose the ability to wirelessly tether to it unless you were to buy a $1000 Wi-Fi battery grip that doesn't even give you any advantage in battery because the two batteries inside it only one of them still is powering the camera so it still sucks it down as quickly as it does. The other one just powers the Wi-Fi FTP type of stuff. It just it isn't worth it, <laughs> you know, just to be able to wirelessly, you know, and the camera gets bigger and all that, right? So it's harder to fly on a gimbal. Um, the R5C is the wrong choice uh, for, for this particular thing. Uh, I'm going to keep it anyway because I do enjoy the advantages that it gives for kind of commercial work and, you know, doing the, that higher frame rate raw and, uh, the no record limit, you know, and all that kind of stuff. It, it, it It's advantageous for that. Um, but for real estate, stick with the R5 or one of the Sony options. The way that you work with the apps with this, okay, is, is a little bit different, uh, one from the next. Now, I like the Sony Imaging Edge app better for a few different reasons than the Canon app, uh, the Canon Connect app. The big difference is the Imaging Edge app has actual resolution on the preview, whereas the Canon app does not. And so the Canon app was made for a phone, I'm told. And so when you blow that up into the screen of an iPad, it it's soft. It kind of looks like it's out of focus all the time, even if it isn't. And, you know, that's a tough way to work. <laughs> now, thankfully, uh, Canon has uh, focusing tools that are robust enough that you can still trust them that what you are pointing at is in focus, okay? But the Sony is certainly better with that, as it is better with being able to control everything about the camera just within the app, whereas with the Canon, you got to pick and choose a little bit. And so, for instance, one of the things that I really like with the Sony Imaging Edge app versus the Canon is that I can have the camera dial on aperture priority, which is how I shoot... Um, all of my exteriors and detail shots, I will use aperture priority and I will use 
the exposure compensation dial there for that. Now, when I'm within the app, the Imaging Edge app, I can change to manual, even though the dial on the camera is still set to aperture priority. And so I can change to manual, I can change the focusing from auto to manual. So I can do all that in the app, which then makes the camera do those things. And then when I am ready to go back out to the yard to do more aperture priority shots with autofocus, all I have to do is turn the app off and the camera will automatically swap back over to what is set on the dials, aperture priority and in this case, AFC. So that is super handy just as a matter of workflow. The Canon is a lot more limited. It's, it's a lot more limited. Um, the different controls you have on, on the app, there's no way you can do anything like I just said on the Canon app. You can't even control some of those things on the Canon app. But where the Canon app shines is how you select different values. And I like that it has a scale that kind of moves and will have big, it looks kind of like a ruler. So it'll have big lines and it'll have little lines in between. So the big lines have values, the little lines are increments between those two values. And what the big lines with the values are meant to be is our stops. And so, you know, from one big line to another big line is a stop. And so that is a very handy way to quickly do it to see where exactly, you know, how many stops you're moving here, how many stops you're moving there. So if I want to, let's say, increase my shutter speed two stops, um, it, you know, I know that I will have to increase my ISO, you know, and I, I can do it like that so I can make the exposure the same and have the flash more powerful and, and you know, and so forth. Um, that's easier to do on the Canon app. Neither one is perfect. The Sony is a little bit more responsive and it um, it has a little bit better of a system to preview images, but I hated the Canon app at first, but I'm really getting used to it. And I think I can probably work a little bit faster even with the Canon app than with the Sony one. So whether you will like them or not, one or the other, they are different. Both cameras though, okay, have a really good range. And that's something that's different with the Alpha One versus the other Sony cameras that came before it is those cameras just had a horrible range. Uh, you know, if you were inside and you had like one wall between you, you, you were going to drop out. And then it was tough to reconnect. Uh, both these cameras have a good range. And in practice, I find that the Canon is easier to, to connect and easier to reconnect if it does drop out. But it's pretty unlikely to happen shooting an average house. Speaking of Sony options, the A7 IV has that crop in 4K60, which um, does matter for real estate because now you need super ultra wide lenses to get yourself a similar perspective as a full frame perspective with the wide lens on it. And you are using a smaller portion of the sensor, which already has very small photo sites on it in comparison to, say, the A7S3. And it is noisier. All the Sony cameras are noisy down low, and it it looks kind of like a, a gray Technicolor mud, you know, with with their with their log curves. I don't think they even should have had log curves in the older Sony bodies, like the A7 III, and you know, and the the eight bit ones. Uh, now they have ten bit. They can better handle, you know, those those log profiles. Sony's do highlight roll off and retention really really well I, I mean cinema camera well and um, it's incredible how much like a cinema camera you can get a sony image to behave like when it comes to how those highlights roll off however the achilles heel there is their shadows are just junk and, and they always have been and they're, like I said, they're kind of muddy and gray and, uh, you know, and noisy. And, and noise reduction is going to be in your workflow with Sony cameras. However, when I shoot on RED or the few times, I'm not hugely experienced with doing real estate video on the Canons yet, but the few times I have, um, the noise is easier to deal with. It's, it's less prevalent it is cleaner and that it's not a bunch of 
chroma noise with you know different colors and blotches and and things like that in it. Um, in the case of the R5C, you can actually black shade the sensor, which is nice, you know, so you, you can map out where the where the static noise is. Um, the Canons are better uh, for that than the Sonys if you don't have a high priority on seeing through the windows. So on, on some projects, on some luxury homes, a lot of times luxury homes are as expensive as they are because they have a view that they do. The Sonys are better for that uh, because you have that soft highlight roll off and, and you're able to discern better what the view outside the windows are as you're, as you're touring the home. Uh, they do that better than the Canons. Um, they, they do it honestly as good as the red. Um, a, a lot of the time the Sony's are, are really good at that overall value. Now this, this is a tough, this is a tough nut to crack because the Alpha One is, in my opinion, the best stills camera that has ever been created, full stop. Uh, I'll, I'll fight somebody on that. It, it just is. It is insane, the capabilities of the Sony A1. It is a $6,500 camera body. Just this part right here is $6,500. Is it worth, is it a better value than the R5? I don't think so. You, you know, because the R5 for what I do is 90% of what the A1 is at half the price. And now we're going to talk about video. The R5 is much more robust in, in video than, than is the A1, uh, especially in the R5C form. And that's maybe a video I'll do at some point, you know, the differences in R5C versus, but that, that video has been done out there, you know? So for real estate photography, one of the big, one of the big differences, one of the big advantages, actually, I should have gone over this earlier about the A1 for photo is I like this screen. I like that it tilts. I can do high shots. I can do low shots. I can go on about my day um, with the R5. And it's flippy screen, and I've used these before. I've got the A7IV, I've got the A7S3 has screens like this. It's just usually not as good for taking stills images on tripods, with the exception of it being just like this and me looking at it sideways if it's like aimed into a small bathroom or something like that. But um, this is just a this is a better body for that. The the A1 is now. When you're talking about video, it's completely different because when you put a camera like this that has the tilt screen on a gimbal, what happens is your screen is being blocked by the gimbal motor. And I know that, you know, all the modern gimbals have the gimbal motor a little bit slow, uh, you know, further down, but, you know, you usually have it out a little bit like this anyway, and your screen is blocked by the gimbal motor. Now, with cameras nowadays that track things, I like to use the track on gimbals. And so I will poke the screen and it will track something and I'll roll my shot and I know my focus is going to stick on that, whatever. This is more difficult to do that because I got to reach around and, you know, and kind of do it and it upsets my balance, and, you know. And so um, it's not as useful for video as the R5. For an everyday real estate hybrid, the R5 packs a ton more value. The A1 is a better stills camera. It, I can work faster and more confidently with this camera. All this is well and good, you say, but you were a Sony shooter for a long time. Why are you even getting in, you know, why are you even looking at Canon? It's because I enjoy shooting motion on Red Komodo. And over the past couple of years, I have been building my RF lens collection shooting on Red Komodo. I also, because of the colors thing, don't really enjoy shooting commercial work on Sony. I like shooting that on Red also, or on Blackmagic, uh, which, which I'm shooting now. Now, the Red Komodo comes with a native RF mount. I look at this as an opportunity to consolidate my system. So when I'm doing stills and I'm doing video, I don't have to bring two completely different systems because that's what I'm doing sometimes now. I bring in the Sony and all the Sony lenses. I bring in the, 
red and all the cannon lenses. Um, I can have just cannon stills bodies in red and one set of lenses. That's why I'm even looking at this. The truth of it is, any of these cameras, the a7 IV II, the R5C, you're going to be able to get images that are near as makes no difference out of any of these, you know, for interiors. It's, you know, you got to look at it for what it is. For interiors, you can get great images out of any of these, but the Canons are the ones that allow me to consolidate my system, have less gear in the van. Um, and I really do like the RF lenses. I think they are overall better lenses than the G Master lenses are. And I have several of each. And, and so, uh, you know, that's what I'm looking to do. So what am I going to do going forward? Um, I'm going to keep everything for now. You know, I'm, I'm blessed in that I have room in my life for two different systems. I can continue twiddling with them, even if it means using the Sony's like, you know, these different cameras that I'm, uh, that I'm filming this with right now. Uh, you know, there's, there's use to that. Which one of these cameras is going to be right for you? I don't know. Because they do behave very differently. But I can make a great case for either one of them. I hope this helped you, though, in a little way. Decide between them. This was meant to be a review of what it's like to work with these cameras. I didn't get deep into specs. I didn't shoot at charts, you know, things like that. This is just a working photographer's point of view on these two systems. Got anything from it? I'd love to have you around, so please like and subscribe, and I will see you again.